All right, engineers, in this video, we're going to talk about the urea cycle. Okay, so specifically, if you guys remember where we left, left off last, we talked about transamination and oxidative deamination. Let's just go really, really fast through that. So if you remember, inside of the muscle, we have a specific amino acid that we wanted to talk about, and that was alanine, right? And if you guys remember, alanine was combining with a specific keto acid, which was called alpha keto glutarate. Then alpha keto glutarate and alanine were reacting. And what happened? You formed two different things. One is you formed, we're gonna put over here, alanine will form specifically, ooh, let's actually make these different colors. Let's make alanine green. That way we don't confuse it. So let's say here's alanine. Alanine will get converted into pyruvate. But then alpha ketoglutarate will get converted into a specific amino acid, which is called glutamate. Now, this again was driven by a specific enzyme, and the name of that enzyme was alanine amino transferase, or ALT for short. And this is again, if you guys remember, this is also a reversible pathway. Okay. Then we said that the glutamate was actually coming into the blood and going to the liver. So let's actually bring this glutamate over here. It's actually getting transported through the blood, and then what? Into the liver. Then what did we say? Then we said once we had this glutamate specifically over here inside of this actual liver cell, you guys remember that there was a special enzyme. And that special enzyme in this process was doing a couple things. One thing that it was doing is it was taking NADP positive and converting it into NADPH. So what is happening? This is undergoing, he's undergoing reduction, but he's oxidizing the glutamate. Another thing that you'll remember is that we're specifically yanking a specific component out of the glutamate. What is that specific component that we're yanking out of the glutamate? We're pulling out ammonia. All right, so this is our ammonia, which is extremely, extremely toxic, and we'll talk about why it's toxic. Then the glutamate is also going to have a hydration step. So you know you're gonna add water into this component, right? Because you know this is a two-step reaction. So water is added into this step in the second step. And then you're gonna generate alpha keto glutarate. And you guys remember that the alpha ketoglutarate could go and react with alanine, could react with aspartate, and continue those transamination processes. What was the enzyme that was driving this step? This enzyme, if you guys remember, that was driving this step was called glutamate dehydrogenase enzyme. Okay, so this is the glutamate dehydrogenase enzyme, and he is stimulating this pathway to convert glutamate into alpha ketoglutarate, adding in water, generating an NADPH, which is a good reducing agent, which could be used in two pathways. What are those two pathways? Specifically could use in free radical reactions uh, with uh, applications to the glutathione. And then another one is fatty acid synthesis. Okay. Then we push out the ammonia. Now, let's talk about briefly why ammonia is toxic. You know another thing can happen to the ammonia in certain po uh, points, it can actually gain a proton. So let's say it gains a proton. If it gains this proton, it actually turns into NH4 positive. You know this is called ammonium. When would you be generating a lot of ammonia to where it's toxic? If there's maybe some type of condition where there is excessive protein breakdown or degradation. If there's excessive protein breakdown and degradation, you're going to make a lot of ammonia. You know certain types of bodybuilders who are taking in excessively large amounts of protein? So much protein to their body can't actually incorporate into the tissues anymore and it starts getting broken down. As those proteins are getting broken down and catabolized consistently, what is it going to do? It's going to generate tons and tons of ammonia. That ammonia is super toxic to these actual bodybuilders. And we'll explain why. So what does this ammonia do? It can actually get converted into ammonium. You know this ammonium? It can actually get pushed out here into the bloodstream. And then you know what can happen? Okay. In our brain, we have specific types of cells. You know what these cells are called that are actually found inside of our brain and they're controlling what's leaving the blood 
and entering into like the neural tissues out here. This guy right here, look at this guy. This is called a astrocyte. So what is this guy right here called? This is a astrocyte. Astrocytes are very, very special type of cells. We'll talk about these in neuro. But what's kind of really, really cool about these astrocytes is that they have a special enzyme that not many tissue cells have. This enzyme is called glutamine synthetase or synthase, but I'm going to put synthetase. What do I mean? This glutamine synthetase is a special enzyme. And what this glutamine synthetase does is, is it converts a molecule called glutamate into glutamine. So again, what is that molecule that it can make as a result? It can make a molecule called glutamine. Now, in order for glutamate to be converted into glutamine, what do you need to add? You know all the differences between glutamate and glutamine is an amine group? So, you know what can happen? This ammonium that we generated from this uh, you know, amino acid catabolism process. Let's say I take this ammonium here, and I have this ammonium and I incorporate it into here. So now I'm gonna have this ammonium here and I'm gonna incorporate it into this process of converting glutamate with the ammonium into glutamine. Why is this dangerous? Because you know glutamine is osmotically active. You know what that means? So let's say that I have a lot of water flowing through this area, through cerebral blood vessels, right? So here's a lot of water. And as there's a buildup of glutamine due to excessive amounts of ammonia in the form of ammonium, right? If there's excessive amounts of this ammonium, I'm gonna make excessive amounts of glutamine. What is that gonna do? That's gonna suck water, where? Into the brain. What do you call that whenever you pull, pull significant amounts of water into the brain? They call this cerebral edema, brain swelling. Why is that dangerous? Because you know brain swelling can actually raise intracranial pressure. So your intracranial pressure could increase, which can cause extra, could, might cause herniation of the brain. Or it can even lead to comatose. It could lead to comatose. You could actually go into a coma because of excessive amounts of this ammonia. So this ammonia is causing significant cerebral edema by pulling water in. How? By reacting with the glutamine synthetase and bringing glutamate, excessive amounts of ammonia lead to excessive amounts of glutamine. If there's excessive amounts of glutamine, it's going to suck water into the brain and lead to cerebral edema, which can lead to high intracranial pressure or maybe even comatose. And if there's high intracranial pressure, it can lead to the brain herniation, which is extremely dangerous. Okay, not only can it do that, the ammonium can also combine with another molecule to form what's called glycine. So you can also, we're not going to talk about the mechanism, but you can have this ammonium being incorporated into a molecule and leading into the formation of excessive amounts of glycine. So we can have a lot of glycine or we can have a lot of glutamine because of this excessive amounts of ammonium. And again, these two molecules can pull water into the brain or other different tissue cells. And this can be extremely disastrous, neurotoxic, damage to the neurons. So how do we deal with that? We'll talk about how we deal with it, it gets so excessive, but that's why it can become very dangerous. How do we deal with that and prevent that from happening? Okay, see this ammonia? Or we can actually convert it into ammonium. I'm gonna take this ammonium and I'm gonna push it into the mitochondria, okay? I'm gonna push it into the mitochondria. Once it's in the mitochondria, it's going to combine with a special, couple special molecules. So see here, I redraw. Here's my ammonium, NH4 positive. I'm going to combine this with another two molecules. So let's say I combine it with bicarbonate, but specifically about two units of bicarbonate. So two bicarbonates. Okay, so here's my bicarbonate, HCO3 negative. And then I have to run this reaction in the presence of adenosine triphosphate, ATP. So now I need... ATP for this reaction. Okay, in order for this to happen, in order for me to take the bicarbonate, the NH4+, and the ATP and convert all of that into a new molecule, I'm going to need a special enzyme for this process. This new molecule that I'm going to make is called carbamoyl phosphate. So what is this molecule called? It's called carbamoyl, carbamoyl, phosphate. 
And the enzyme that's working in this step is trying to synthesize the carbamyl phosphate. So what enzyme do you think this is? We're going to abbreviate it here. It's called carbamyl phosphate synthetase type 1. So again, what is this enzyme here called? This enzyme is specifically called carbamyl phosphate synthetase type 1. Now, what this enzyme is going to do is it's going to convert the ATP, the ammonium, and the bicarbonate ions into carbamyl phosphate. Then what's going to happen? You know there's a molecule that we actually have a lot of inside of this area. It's, an, it's, it's not actually a type of amino acid that we actually make. We actually make this amino acid in our body. You, there's, you know there's different types of amino acids, essential amino acids and non-essential non amino acids. So with essential amino acids, we actually have to take those actual amino acids in through the diet. Whereas non-essential amino acids, we can actually make those in the body. We don't have to get it through the diet. One of those is actually called ornithine. So we have a molecule called ornithine. Ornithine is going to come in and it's going to combine with the carbamyl phosphate. So look what happens here as a result. I'm going to take the ornithine and I'm going to take the carbamyl phosphate and I'm going to combine them. Okay? So I'm taking these two guys. Who? Who am I taking here? I'm taking the ornithine and I'm taking the carbamyl phosphate and I'm combining these two guys and converting them into a new molecule. What is this new molecule called? This new molecule call is called citrulline. This new molecule is called citrulline. Then, after I do this, I need an enzyme to catalyze this step. This enzyme is extremely, extremely important. This enzyme is called ornithine transcarbamoylase. Transcarbamoylase enzyme. This ornithine transcarbamylase enzyme is going to catalyze this step. So again, what is he doing? He's taking the ornithine, fusing with the carbamyl phosphate, and turning it into citrulline. Now, this citrulline, he's going to combine with a special molecule. You know what that molecule is called? That molecule is called aspartate. But the question is, just see if you guys are linking this all together. Where does that aspartate coming from? You remember there was a shuttle that I used to take the malate and I pushed the malate in? And then I used the, that same shuttle to push another molecule out. What was that molecule? Aspartate. So now I can push out this molecule called aspartate, or the aspartate. I guess it would be nicer to say, right? And then the aspartate is going to do what? It's going to fuse with this citrulline. So now this citrulline, let's actually draw with a pink arrow, make it look pretty. This citrulline is going to combine with the aspartate. When these two molecules fuse together, they're going to make a new molecule. And this molecule is called argino, argino succinate. Argino succinate is being formed from the actual conversion of or the reaction of citrulline and aspartate. Now, what enzyme is catalyzing this reaction? This enzyme is called argino succinate synthase or synthetase, right? And what this enzyme is doing is, is it's taking these two molecules and reacting them together and stimulating this step. And so now, citrulline and aspartate will then be reacted on by arginosuccinate, I'm sorry, arginosuccinate synthetase to convert it into arginosuccinate. Then, arginosuccinate is gonna have another enzyme. So now, look what's gonna happen as a result here. The arginosuccinate, is going to go into this next step. And in this step, out of the arginosuccinate, I'm going to release out another molecule. What is that molecule that I'm going to pop out of here? I'm going to get rid of fumarate. I'm going to pop off a fumarate. When I pop off the fumarate, it then converts arginosuccinate into another molecule referred to as arginine. Arja Mean. Now, when this arginosuccinate is converted into arginine, there's a specific enzyme that is involved in this process. This enzyme is called arginosuccinase. So the enzyme catalyzing this reaction here is called arginosuccinase enzyme. So this arginosuccinase enzyme is actually ripping the fumarate out of arginosuccinate and converting them into arginine. Now we get to the most important part. 
you know, it was still hanging into that arginine. This, this actual ammonia has kind of been hidden in all of these structures, but it's undergoing specific types of modifications. There's a specific component of the arginine that I'm going to rip out in this next step. So in this next step, I'm going to convert the arginine back into ornithine because it's going to be a nice cycle, right? But in that process, I'm going to have another special enzyme. This is a very, very important enzyme. This enzyme is called arginase. Arginase. And what arginase is doing in this step is arginase is acting on the arginine and yanking out a special structure. What is that special molecule yanked from this? This is called urea. So then we yank out of this the urea. Where can that urea go? The urea can then eventually go into the blood and then get sent to the kidneys. And then if it's taken into the kidneys, where will, what will happen in the kidneys? You're going to urinate it out. Because this is a nitrogenous waste product. So this is actually going to get sent into the blood, taken to the kidneys, and urinated out of the body. But you know urea also has other pro processes that we'll talk about in renal physiology with helping with recycling for the osmotic gradients. Okay. Now, when we push this urea out, then it can get urinated out and help to decrease the actual ammonia levels. All right, so now, now that we put this urea into the bloodstream, so now this urea is in the bloodstream, like I said, it can go to the kidney, it can get urinated out. So we can try to get rid of the ammonia inside of a less toxic form. So ammonia is extremely toxic, and so, and so is urea, but it's, it's actually significantly less toxic as compared to ammonia. Now, this is how we're get rid of, getting rid of the ammonia. So you can imagine any type of deficiency or mutation in any of these enzymes, particularly ornithine transcarbamylase or arginosuccinate synthetase, or even arginosuccinase can cause significant or detrimental effects on the body. Now, in conditions in which there is this situation where you might have some type of deficiency or some type of mutation in one of these urea cycle enzymes, and your ammonia level or your ammonium level is significantly high and you have this cerebral edema due to the accumulation of a lot of glutamine and a lot of glycine, so also a lot of glycine, how do they treat this? And they give these people what's called benzoate, or they can also give another molecule called phenyl butyrate. What do these two molecules do that helps to alleviate some of these problems? These guys are specifically binding on to the glutamine and the glycine. You know specifically the benzoate is helping to be able to pick up some of these molecules and some of, some of the phenylbutyrate. So benzoate and phenyl, uh, the phenylbutyrate are doing what? They're yanking what? They're yanking this glutamine and they're yanking the glycine out of the actual tissues. And as you're pulling out more glutamine, more glycine, you're getting rid of ammonia out of the blood. Where is this going to go? It's going to go on to these guys. These benzoate and this phenylbutyrate, when it pulls up this glutamine and this glycine, where can it go? It can then go to the kidneys. And in the kidneys, it'll excrete these molecules in the urine. Okay, so our body has a very interesting way of dealing with this, right? This ammonia, this toxic molecule. But in certain conditions, in which maybe there's a defect in the actual uh, urea cycle enzymes, and there's a significant increase in these actual ammonia levels, and you could develop a lot of glutamine uh, accumulation, a lot of glycine accumulation, you can give these people benzoate or phenylbutyrate. And whenever you give them these molecules, they can help to actually pull some of the glycine and pull some of the glutamine from the tissues and from the blood and do what? Take it to the kidneys to be excreted in the urine. If you excrete those, those molecules in the urine, you've technically gotten rid of some of the ammonia and you're decreasing that toxicity in the body. All right, engineers, I hope all of this made sense, guys. Hope you guys all enjoyed it. If you did, hit that like button, subscribe, leave a comment down in the comment section. All right, engineers, until next time.